Today's podcast is brought to you by Blue Canary. The bird has landed on beautiful Bainbridge Island, conveniently located at 499 Madison Avenue. ASE Master Technician Clint Ramsey brings over 15 years of experience, award-winning diagnostic skill, and a desire to reinvent the automotive repair experience. Schedule an appointment online at bluecanary.biz or call them today at 206 206- Four five one four two two zero. I got something for your mind, body, and soul. I got something for your mind, body, and soul. Good podcast, Bill. You found the Bystander Podcast. Happy generic time of day to you. You have found your host, Tiny Tim, aka the Mr. Rogers of Podcasting, the King of Casual. Big shout out to Blue Canary Auto with their new location in Bremerton as well for supporting the show. Sound Reaper Graphics in the Pavilion takes care of all your printing needs and Tideland Magazine. Please check out their new magazine and uh, get an ad in the, in the magazine. It's local, it's uh, communal, and it's a pretty awesome mag. Today, I am talking to Lena. Lena, welcome to the show. How are you? Hi. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm doing well. How about yourself? Uh, really well. I came across your story, and this is really happenstance. Um, I believe it's your parents joined my pea patch at Johnson's farm. Yes, they did. Yes, that's true. We were there <laughs> just today, this uh, afternoon. Yes. Beautiful day for gardening. So that's kind of how I, I found out that there was no, some new people getting a plot in the garden and I wanted to welcome them. I have yet to meet them or see them, but I'm looking forward to it. But then there's this whole backstory about what you're doing. Um, Please, I'd like you to share um, what you're doing. And first off, how long have you been on the island? I've been on the island for about a year, somewhat Welcome. over a year. I'm loving it. Um, it's great. Just today I discovered a beautiful spot. Um, but that's uh, stuff for another time. Um, and yeah, so I've been here for a year. What I do, I work in tech. I work for Nike at the moment. Um, I moved from Seattle and I've been in the United States for six years now, came from Germany. So I used to live in Germany for 15 years and before that, Ukraine. Okay. And you have a little Ukrainian helpers project going on that I would like to highlight in our community. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, it's a great little project created by um, friends of mine back in Ukraine. I'm from the southern town of Mykolaiv. It's a two hours drive from Odessa. It's right now there is an ongoing onslaught of like Russian forces there. So like if you see CNN and there is like a border of like where the Russians are attacking, it's right on the border in the south. So uh, a few friends of mine who have nothing to do with charity or otherwise humanitarian help, um, they were actually working in the restaurant business, decided that it's time to step up when the war broke out and help the community. So they spend their savings to, and their family savings to, you know, find 
materials such as bulletproof vests or uh, food supplies for not just the Ukrainian army, but um, also for the local residents. Um, the idea behind it is that this, like, um, in, in this region in Ukraine or in general in Ukraine, the humanitarian support um, is not really well established. It's not very, like the network is not very big because nobody ever thought about this, I guess, in advance. Maybe I'm making this up, but I know that it's very hard to come by, like to find things uh, there if you really, really need to and the supply is short. And imagine all the roads and the truck and the trucks were uh, stopped coming. So it was really difficult. Um, and the humanitarian organizations like um, Red Cross didn't make it there, especially in the beginning. So they, they weren't there. They concentrated on the big cities or border towns of like Lviv or Kiev uh, and whatever was left uh, over uh, landed in Mykolaiv. So my friends uh, took matters in their own, ha in their own hands and they... Uh, made sure that the supply chain was reestablished. So they would go find, I don't know, like buckwheat, very traditional um, type of food, uh, rice, uh, potatoes, like fully professed anything, um, medical supplies, you know, all you can name it. Um, they would try to find it, buy it in bulk, store it and distribute it. And this all during the war, while uh, the city was bombed, but, you know, they love it. And so I thought, why not help? Um, and so I reached out to Bainbridge Island Review. They wrote about it. Uh, we organized a pop-up on Bainbridge Island in the 11 winery, which is uh, going to happen on the 4th of June again. Awesome. But popular demand, yeah. And uh, we was got... Make borscht, not war, right? That's right, yeah. Love yeah. it. And uh, yeah, we were able to find, uh, you know, uh, organize some support for them, uh, which is great. Where did they even go about finding supplies and how are supplies getting shipped in there? I know uh, FEMA and Red Cross is having a hard time doing anything. So how are your friends mm -hmm. managing this, you know, with lim lot lot less um, resources than these big organizations? Uh, this is a great question. Um, I can give you one example. I know that uh, they were looking for bulletproof vests at some point um, in April, and they would reach out to different contacts, and they have a network, and this network of like friends and family, and imagine everyone in Ukraine became a volunteer overnight. So almost everyone who stayed over didn't have like small kids, and I uh, didn't go to, to fight, uh, was left to help over. Like almost everyone was involved. And so you start texting, you start reaching out on social media. Hey, do you know anyone who does, uh, you know, who, who produces a bulletproof vest for their contact? So, um, and they were able to find a few providers, one in Kiev, another one in Lvov, a third one in Odessa. And they were able to pick and choose uh, whichever one had better quality and better price point or like bulk pricing, for example. Wow. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so uh, there are some positive moments in terms of uh, they're not fighting against their own people, right? So like the everyone's trying to help them. Now, what is the electricity and internet situation like out there? The electricity was breaking up now and then, not super critical, so it wasn't fairly bad. Uh, internet was also great. I know they had problems with water supply, so the uh, they didn't have water for more than a month. Um, oh, running water, I, yeah. Running water, that's right. Um, so it was even in the news. People in Mikolai were picking water from rivers, from puddles, from... You know, whenever you can, wherever you can find it, some like people who tried to make money off of it, they brought bottles of water and sell, sold them for like a lot of money and so on. So it was almost a humanitarian cat catastrophe. Um, 
What is, what is the ter terrain like there? Is there freshwater lakes or rivers or in that area? There are two rivers. Um, the problem is that most of it would be not suitable for drinking, especially in the city line. Um, at least I would not advise it. So they would need to uh, reestablish the connection with the uh, filtration and stuff with the filtration. Exactly. Don't know the details, but um, this part was like, there was a part that gets bombed uh, and they couldn't get in there because it was like an active war zone. <laughs> wow. I'm surprised you can put a smile on your face. Um, it's such a crisis in my mind. And I think about it every day. Um, also, the amount of pets that had to be left behind and how their your friends are being involved in, you know, feeding stray dogs even. I mean, yeah. it's serious grassroots level um, help. Grassroots, yeah, exactly. That's a good word to um, name it. We have a friend there who adopted 78 cats. Wow. And one blind cat <laughs> and dog. I think too. So uh, she has a zoo <laughs> <laughs> as she calls it herself. And uh, yeah, she will not move. She, it's like 29 year old girl um, or woman. And she doesn't want to leave because of that. Um, very courageous. Uh, my parents didn't want to abandon their cat. So we have a cat um, here on the Island now, though we have two, two dogs and me and my partner, we had two dogs before that, and now there is a cat in the house as well. <laughs> and uh, it's going well for the dogs because they get extra food from the cat. They still mm. get food, <laughs> but the cat doesn't really like having company. So. Tell me a little bit about how you connected with your parents and got them to Bainbridge Island. That, yeah, that was... Um, not so easy <laughs> because, uh, yes, I, I'm smiling now, but before it was exhausting. Um, as the war started, I was calling them. I mean, even before that, right, like we all knew that this is going to happen. Like we all watched the news and like hoped it's avoidable. And so I was calling my parents and they were dismissing it. Like, no, nah, it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. They're like, just it's just panic. You in the mm. United States, the United States, you're always panicking. And I'm like, oh, my God. Um, okay. Because they have, like, different type of media over there. They have, like, their own. They're older yeah. people. And they're mistrustful, you know, over there. So, like, it's, it's kind of like here. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm, well, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Then uh, uh, similar um, uh, attitude. And then the war started. And they're like, ah, they're never going to come here. They're going to surrender in three days anyway. Mm. And then it didn't stop. And then there is like a fierce resistance and nobody wants to, you know, it goes on and on and on. And then the bombing comes to that city uh, where they're at. And then in, Ma in March, I think I am in the business meeting uh, and I'm like scrolling through Telegram feed. This is where the news about Ukraine are coming like live from people in Ukraine and I'm reading the address of my parents' uh, apartment building. And it says these areas got bombed. And I'm reading the address um, of my parents' house. And I'm trying to call them my friend who is in Toronto, but we are in like online and she knows my parents. They also she also tries calling them and they don't pick up and we are freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm yeah. trying to wrap up the meeting. I'm trying to like, okay, like this is all cool. And then like pick up the phone, call my dad. And then after a while he picks up and is like, why are you like, why are you calling me? What do you want? <laughs> What's up? <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, weren't you just bombed? It's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. There was a shelling right here. I think our windows are like all broken right now. And I'm trying to fix satellite connection because our TV doesn't work. I was like, are you okay? Is it? what like super casually just tells me that they nearly got killed and every day since then for a month i've been like trying to convince them you gotta come you gotta come you gotta you know think about your life think about 
whatever, like your future. And they're like, we're not going to abandon our house. We're not going to abandon our um, little garden or their big garden to be precise. And because they're really avid farmers as uh, this is how you've met. So to say, yeah. because they're like into that a lot and we're not going to abandon our cat. We're not going to do this. We're old people. Why do we do it? And this went on and on and on for a month. And then they just gave in, gave in and said, you know, if it continues, um, I'm just going to, you know, end up with a heart attack or something like that. Like I'm, my mom had like panic attacks um, uh, almost that. every night because uh, uh, it was uh, very loud at night. She couldn't sleep. Even now when there's an airplane like coming by, um, sometimes they just like feel it, it's bombing which is a sign of PTSD, but they're really traumatized by uh, and scared real time um, and decided that they're going to move on. Like they're going to take the cat. They're going to trust me to arrange the trip to come and pick them up. So this is how I convinced I convinced them and how they got um, how they decided to uh, to to leave. So how does the logistics even work? You know, how do you get a flight out of the Ukraine or do you cross a border and then get shuttled or is it a train situation? How do you flee a country that's under bombing? It's an adventure. Uh, it was a real adventure. Um, one local organization uh, from Odessa organized a bus trip from Mykolaiv to Odessa to Romania, to Bucharest. Which, uh, uh, so they organized a bus trip with everything, like with food, uh, with a little bit of storage room for everyone to like, or carry on, like a little bit of, uh, one, one, could, uh, one person could take a small carry on. So they had room for that. They were feeding them. They were like making breaks um, and making sure everyone um, got, you know, documentation that they need to cross the border. Um, and so they uh, took the bus uh to Bucharest which was about 12 hours maybe longer longer than 12 hours trip wow. and then they crossed the border by ferry there is like a little ferry uh and ended up in Bucharest in Bucharest and this is like a miracle the whole trip is like a miracle of like how such crazy situation very like a situation you don't want to be but like how they got so lucky and uh, everyone treated them so nicely and um, I guess they were like carried by I don't know what good luck universe you name it into like to be able to come here anyway so they're in Bucharest and they're in this uh, refugee camp in the middle of Bucharest um, and they're being taken care of they have a bed they have all types of food they have a vet they have a doctor um, everything they need somebody comes over and like there is a volunteer that says volunteers that speak Ukrainian and speak Russian and they help them find a bus to Budapest and Budapest is where in um, I flew out to meet them I couldn't find a flight to Romania so I decided to go to Budapest and meet them there so they took a train which was like 10 euros or like three actually because of the situation because of the support that the countries in New York providing um, they took the night train and arrived to Budapest and then were taken to a, um, a refugee um, camp kind of or distribution center. I don't know what you call this mm -hmm. place um, where they waited for me to arrive with the cat. And they got also very nice treatment. There was a volunteer that could you know, help them with finding food Um the cat got vaccinate, uh, rabies vaccination and the chip, which is a require EU requirement. It doesn't matter if your cat like had it before or not, you've got to do that. Um, so they helped with everything, like all those little details that were really thought out. Um, and then I arrived, they made sure I was their relative because they're really careful about people not being trafficked. Um, and um, so I took my parents, and we stayed there for about a week in Budapest to make sure that my mom's passport got extended, for example, and book trips. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. So her, she didn't have a valid um, foreign passport for, that uh, needed for her travel. 
And we, you know, arranged a few details like that. And then my partner, so from Bainbridge Island, he came over and we booked trip, uh, we booked flights from Budapest to Mexico, believe it or not, because mm. back then um, there was no way for a Ukrainian without a valid visa um, to enter the United States. Wow. Yes. Um, the tourist visa would not be issued because like, well, you're never going to come back here to, if you're, you know, countries in the war, uh, in war, at war. And um, so we had to cross the border through Tijuana. And so we booked trips, uh, flights from, uh, you know, Budapest to Tijuana. And my partner took the cat because we didn't want the cat to cross the border. Um, so the cat flew with Michael from Budapest to Seattle. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, then Michael booked the flight from Seattle to San Diego, rented a car and drove to Tijuana. At the same time, we arrived to Tijuana from Mexico because there were like obviously some layovers on the way. Um, my parents never thought, I'm just, telling you they were like never expected to be in mexico in their whole life but <laughs> i bet <laughs> they're like we're in mexico this is crazy um and so we're in tijuana and around at the airport and the first thing we see is ukrainian flags everywhere um mm. american ukrainians mostly uh from churches organized um a receiving party the receiving party and the and the humanitarian camp to cross the border so they help with the communication it was like well oiled machine how it ran like people re registered got a number and this number was like number in line to cross the border and this border corridor was specifically reserved for uh people uh from ukraine and then they took us to the camp and in the i don't know camp, i will call it a camp uh the refugee center and there were beds in there and there was food again and everyone was in like supportive and there was legal help um people were able to you know answer questions and get support get some clothes get um anything they needed uh, while they were waiting in line for the number to be called out that's awesome yeah. and then they they crossed the border they called them out it was it lasted it was about four hours in total um, and then they came to, uh, then we met them on the other side in San Diego, <laughs> near San Diego. And, uh, yeah, they were greeted with borscht, which was really nice. That's an awesome story. That must've been kind of hell for a long time though, seeing all this travel through and having so many unknowns. Um, how did your parents handle it? Uh, now that you asked me, I realized it must have been really hard for them. Um, they were surprisingly tough uh, during the trip. They mm -hmm. were tired. I could see that. And um, they, you know, weren't full of energy, I could tell. But then didn't complain. And um, they were taking it one day at a time. And, um, awesome. yeah. You must be so relieved. Yeah. Um, it was indeed very, it was very hard. Like I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't do anything. It was really tough. And I was like, why, why am I so worried? Like, it's not really, I don't know. It's, it's a strange state of mind, but um, I feel better now for sure. <laughs> Having yeah. a full house. Well, I'm happy for you guys. That's, that's a good story for sure. And I'm glad you guys have all reconnected in a place where hopefully this community is is supportive and and caring and and welcome you guys all in with open arms. And if there's anything you ever need, you know, please don't hesitate to ask. With that said, um, tell us a little bit more about your humanitarian GoFundMe um, project here to help the people of Ukraine get those supplies that you speak of. Yeah, so this is a GoFundMe campaign. Um, it supports the volunteers, uh, Dmitry and Nastya Voloshenko, so they're friends of mine. Um, and it's also a little bit larger organization, so there are like a few more people 
behind it as well who helped them. And the GoFundMe campaign is, um, the link is GoFund. Forward slash F, forward slash my. Mikolaev, yeah. So M I K O L A I V. And I'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I don't remember the link because. I never had to uh, remember it by heart, yeah. Um, <laughs> which is embarrassing. But um, no, not it's, it's not like uh, donate for Kiev or something like that. It's not a simple uh, GoFundMe type address. So let's just get it straight on the show notes and make sure people know about it. So, what type of things are are they doing? Um, they're bringing medical supplies, food supplies. They're doing a lot of shopping. They're doing distribution. What type of things are they looking to purchase with the GoFundMe money? What what can help people the most right now? This is a good question. Um, I need to sync with them on their exact plans. Last time I checked, they needed um, support for, so they needed medical um tools and let me think about the word how to say that this is for skin transfer <laughs> that sounds really bad it's like first aid kits but um it's for people who got Burns. bullet wounds yeah. no bullet one uh so they need to um stretch out the skin patch <laughs> um it's a, it's really specific it's really graphic um i don't want to go into detail but it's for people who uh got shot um and they need some skin transplants. Um, so that's a very expensive medical instrument um, that they were looking to purchase and give to the hospital. Um, I think things along the lines of like, how do we help our soldiers uh, as well? Because, okay, humanitarian support is great and feeding people is great, but uh, we're not going to win this. Like, if, unless we win this war, it will not stop, right? So we need All to right. make sure that the soldiers are supported as well. So people are on the front lines. So I know that always um, needed things are first aid kits, um, the uh, you know things that help with injuries on the battlefield. Um, these are always you know needed. And uh, for example, in April and March. Um, a lot of soldiers were, you know, sick with flu or COVID uh, because nobody talks about it. And they were like, you know, still protecting the co country, but they still need to get this kind of treatment. And it's like trivial, but uh, you need to find 1000 flu medication uh, packages, for example, for mm. like 500 people. And it goes really fast. The savings go really fast, like one day for $1,000 gone <laughs> so hard to predict but it's along the lines of like how do we keep them alive and uh fed <laughs> yeah um how do you feel like the world has responded to ukrainian needs i am so grateful and so my my perception of humanity changed for the better. I didn't think there were so many people who would care. Um, and so many people do care and, and like this empathize with the Ukraine and the situation. And they, mm -hmm. especially in the U S I think it's just the idea of being like free on your land and not liking when like the ability, like the, just the fear of, or not liking somebody else coming over and like taking, you know, not respecting your land. I think there is a very similar feeling of like, I don't understand what I would do if this would happen to me, that this, I would do the same thing. And in the U S particularly, like we got so much positive response and my parents, they never like, believe it or not, they're shocked how nice people are around here. So it's not, like Ukraine is a nice country, but people are not as charitable and people would not necessarily be so kind to strangers. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a little bit different culture. And so 
when they came over, they didn't expect anyone to even care because they're like, well, we are strangers. Why would they help us? But right now they're like, they can't imagine, like they are so grateful to local people on Bainbridge Island who brought over like some clothes or, you know, some um, plant starters or one um, lady donated uh, um, an e-bike so my mom can get to, to the farm because she doesn't drive, which is amazing. Oh, cool. And they're overwhelmed with like the kind response uh, from, from the community. So um, that's a positive story. Um, that's how I call it about the human kindness. Mm-hmm. Well, that's awesome. I'm really going to look forward to uh, meeting your parents and in, in the, at the farm and hanging out and hopefully connecting with them in some fashion, you know, whether it be uh, sharing plants or, or the bounty of our crops or whatever. It'd be great. Yeah. They're excited that's to awesome. meet everyone. Well, I'm going to put your GoFundMe page up on on my social media accounts and this uh podcast lena i really appreciate you taking the time to tell us a story because it's not easy times or easy story to tell yeah. um thank you so much and sorry my dog is barking um thank you so much for inviting me it's been fun um and i'm looking forward to meeting you in person soon <laughs> i can't wait i'll look forward to it as well. Okay. well you've been listening to the bystander be kind <laughs>